Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Leadership Summit on Tobacco or Health webinar series, hosted by the 18th Conference on Tobacco or Health. Today is our first webinar, during which we will discuss tobacco and COVID-19, understanding the science and policy implications. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few features that will allow you to take part in today's event. When joining the webinar, you were prompted to set up your audio by default, the platform selects your computer's mic and speakers. If you prefer joining over the phone, please select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Please note that you are joining in a listen-only mode, which means that you are muted throughout the webinar. However, during our session, you will have the opportunity to engage with our panelists by submitting your text questions in the questions pane. You may send them at any time during the presentation. We will collect and address these questions during the Q&A segment at the end of our panelists' presentations. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to welcome our webinar moderator, Professor Luke Clancy, the Director General of the Tobacco Free Research Institute of Ireland. Professor Clancy is a respiratory physician with an international track record in the era of smoking and health and on the causes, management and prevention of respiratory diseases, particularly air pollution, asthma, cancer, and tuberculosis. He has considerable experience over the last 25 years in directing and coordinating research projects on these conditions. Tobacco Free Research Institute Ireland exists to provide the evidence based to inform tobacco control interventions in Ireland and has an extensive list of peer reviewed publications and numerous published reports, books, and chapters in books on air pollution and tobacco control. Welcome, Professor Luke, and it's over to you. Thank you very much, Joanna, and welcome to everybody. As you will know, this uh, webinar is organized by the Union and the 18th World Conference on Tobacco or Health Scientific and Track Committees. And it's my pleasure to welcome the speakers today. There's our Dr. Silvana Gallus, Dr. Janice Leon, and Dr. Katrin Egbe. Our first speaker will be uh, Silvana, Dr. Silvana Gallus. And Silvano leads the Laboratory of Lifestyle Epidemiology of the Mario Negri Institute in Milan, Italy. He is also Honorary Associate Professor in Nottingham University in UK. His main in uh, research interests include tobacco control in Italy and Europe, and also he's Associate Editor of multiple journals, including Scientific Reports and the Journal of Epidemiology. He is either author or co-author of very numerous papers, well over 340. And these include at least 300 peer review articles in peer reviewed journals. Also, some of you will have known that last year he was awarded the IG Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2019. Uh, and I think he's rather proud of that as well. But today he's uh, going to speak to us on uh, something quite different is going to the title of his talk is on smoking and COVID-19 review of publications to date. This is no mean task and we're very grateful to Dr. Uh, okay, I start my presentation. Um, I will, uh, good afternoon everybody, I will go very fast because I want to show you several uh, slides uh, and uh, in collaboration with the WHO we are conducting uh, a systematic review of the scientific literature in order to, um, in order to understand, to better understand the relationship not only between tobacco smoking and COVID-19 but also between electronic cigarette or other tobacco product use and COVID-19. For uh, this presentation, I will focus the attention on uh, tobacco smoking only. 
and our uh, research questions included uh, the risk uh, of incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection for smokers versus no smokers and the, the risk of hospitalization severity and mortality for smokers versus no smokers among COVID-19 uh, patients. This slide shows uh, um, the relatively complex uh, uh, methodology used in this uh, systematic review. We involved uh, a traditional uh, review um, and uh, based on PubMed Medline and Web of Science and uh, also an umbrella review and therefore a review of uh, um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis and the review also of preprint archives including chaos and uh, med archive. I will, this is uh, one of the uh, first preliminary results I want uh, to show with you and therefore the number of uh, publications uh, we considered eligible for our review. 370 publications, which is a, 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 long a, a big number. Uh, uh, our search uh, uh, strategy was applied uh, to various uh, uh, libraries uh, the 15th of uh, July. Um, out of 370 publications, uh, we found uh, 175 uh, studies based on case series uh, showing, uh, in providing information on the pre on smoking prevalence in SARS-CoV-2 positive uh, subjects, which is a huge number. Mostly uh, these uh, um, publications were uh, um, preprints, uh, 98 out of 175. The number of cohorts we found providing data on the risk of COVID-19 for smokers versus non-smokers was uh, uh, quite uh, large, 32, but uh, only eight of them were peer reviewed. And then we found 16, 70, and 41 um, papers um, providing uh, the relative risk of hospitalization, severity, and mortality, respectively, um, for smokers versus no smokers among. Uh, COVID-19 patients. I want to talk to you now on the uh, tobacco, tobacco smoking and COVID-19 incidence. I want uh, to, 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 to state that um, a number of studies, as I already mentioned, 175 studies um, uh, were conducted on to understand the smoking prevalence among the SARS-CoV-2 positive uh, subjects or COVID-19 patients. And these uh, studies, most of them show a relatively low smoking prevalence among the SARS-CoV-2 positive uh, subjects. Uh, in here we have a few examples. However, it is important to put in evidence that uh, these studies suffered from several uh, limitations. In particular, most studies suffered from selection bias, various types of selection bias, and many studies suffered from information bias. But the main limitations of, the, of these studies uh, is inherent to their study design. In fact, the case series without a control group, a comparison group, cannot be used to support any causal conclusion. We, therefore, must rely on cohort study. And uh, this is uh, the, um, the, the, the this slide shows uh, the forest plot for current versus never smokers uh, and for X versus never smokers provided by Simons and colleagues. This is uh, a um, meta-analysis uh, conducted uh, and a living meta-analysis updated up to September to 
to 2020. Um, we will be disappointed a bit on the fact that we didn't, uh, I will not show our results because, simply because our uh, meta-analysis are not yet completed and therefore we uh, show the uh, findings from uh, um, available meta-analysis. In this case, uh, Simons and colleagues found a relative risk of 0.5 74 for current versus uh, nether smokers, a relative risk of mm -hmm. COVID-19 incidence, and uh, um, a, a, which was statistically significant, and, and a relative risk of 1.05 uh, for X versus uh, nether, nether smokers. Also, um, Simons found that uh, the high quality studies were very limited, and therefore we can see that only Merkley showed uh, a, a, a presented a good quality study. We expect to find similar results and the preliminary findings uh, um, confirm this. However, we are aware that high quality publications and studies are just, are just a few. Of those uh, available in this uh, table, you can see uh, the distribution of 13 uh, studies uh, providing uh, the relative risk of current versus uh, never smokers, um, or the, the risk of COVID-19 incidence. As you can see, only four of these 13 studies uh, were, uh, were, were uh, published in peer review review journals, only eight studies had a relatively high sample size and only five provided adjusted estimates. Moreover, and more importantly, only four um, uh, had, uh, were based on population generalizable to the general population. And this is extremely important uh, for us, and this is uh, something uh, new because I didn't uh, see many um, discussions of papers uh, talking about uh, this aspect. So we noticed that most longitudinal studies were based on cohorts of COVID-19 suspected populations. And therefore, on population with influenza like, like symptoms. Uh, these cohorts suffer of, uh, an, from an important selection bias. Um, the main reason is that uh, smokers have more frequently influenza-like symptoms and are therefore tested more frequently um, than uh, non-smokers. As uh, some studies uh, already shown, for example, Cho et al. using data from the UK Biobank, found that the smokers have more risk, have a higher risk uh, to be tested. Um, this potentially generates a misleading result that the smokers in these types of uh, studies, smokers have a lower risk of being infected also in the absence of a real association. I tried to, to explain uh, this in the, this uh, infographic, but I do not have time to enter into the Details, but uh, you will have the possibility to download afterwards my presentation, my presentation or better this infograph infographic. According to uh, COVID-19 severity, this is the forest plot of a meta-analysis by uh, Patavan Navalnich and uh, Glantz uh, showing a, a um, higher risk, uh, significantly higher risk for ever versus never smokers in uh, COVID-19 progression, it means severity and mortality. Also, Simons and colleagues found an excess risk for current versus never smokers, although not significant. Uh, in fact, the relative risk was 1.25, and uh, uh, for X versus never smokers, in fact, the, the relative risk was 1.52, uh, statistically significant. The figures for uh, mortality were very similar. 
and therefore they found 1.22 for current versus the never smokers and 1.39 significant for ex versus never smokers. In conclusion, we can say that the prevalence studies are case series that cannot be used to support any causal conclusion. And population-based core studies um, are more reliable and we should rely on these types of studies. Uh, but however, the number of high quality studies is limited uh, so far. Uh, the evidence should rely, however, exclusively on these types of studies. The excess risk of severity for smokers versus no sm never smokers appear, appears clearer. And at the end, we can conclude that at present, preventing a serious COVID-19 complications appears to be the latest good reason to avoid smoking and to recommend the smoking cessation. This is the list of participants of the present review of the literature, and I thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Silvano. Um, I will know how difficult it is to get all of this literature together and to try and make sense of it. I suspect we won't fully understand it for, for some time, but thank you very much for bringing us up to date. And I know we will, during the questions, have a chance uh, to address some of these issues that you raise. Uh, but for now, thank you. Thank you very much. We move on, therefore, to our second speaker for today, and um, her title will be Smoking, ACE2, Nicotine, and SARS-CoV-2. Now, within that is a, there are a lot of problems and a lot of uncertainties, like the literature on prevalence and incidence. But to untangle it and make sense of it for us, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Janice Leong, who is a respirologist and clinical scientist at the University of British Columbia and St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, Canada. And therefore, getting up very early in the morning to talk to us. Her research yes. interest is in translational <laughs> airway biology with the focus on the interactions between COPD and chronic viral infections such as HIV. Her work has been supported by the Canadian Institute of Health Research and the Mike L. Uh, Smith Foundation for Health Research. So Janice, uh, smoking, ACE2, nicotine and SARS-CoV-2, please. Thank you. Thanks, Luke, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizers for having me uh, this very early morning. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the relationship between smoking, nicotine, ACE2, and SARS-CoV-2. And I just want to start by saying that there is a caveat to all of these things. Things change quite rapidly uh, in the COVID research world, as you know, um, and there's new discoveries coming out every day. Um, so who's to say what it, uh, our understanding will be of this topic uh, in, say, a month or two? Uh, but what I'm going to do is present to you the findings we have to date. I am going to focus um, on published data and, and not preprint data. Um, and I also uh, will share with you some of our own experience here in our research lab uh, with this topic. Uh, so to start, um, I want to give a a uh, short overview of the mechanisms of cell entry for SARS-CoV-2. So um, this is a diagram we put together for a, a review we published recently in the ERJ, but really the work was all done by Hoffman um, and colleagues in Germany um, who very quickly on, uh, uh, early on in the pandemic, um, described the machinery that's required for SARS-CoV-2 cellular entry. And so this virus requires uh, for cell entry uh, interaction with the ACE2 receptor on the airway cell. And this interaction is primed by a serine protease uh, on the cell called TMPRSS2, and that um, activates the spike protein on uh, SARS-CoV-2, which then allows the virus to uh, then interact uh, with ACE2 and allows for cell entry. 
Um, so the role of ACE2 in the body is best described in terms of its um, modulation of the renin angiotensin system um, because it works to turn angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 1 to 9. Um, and so you might think that having higher ACE2 expression in your airway might uh, set you up for having an increased chance of contracting um, SARS-CoV-2 cellular entry. Uh, and that uh, that might be true, um, but like all things in life, um, you need a balance in this system um, and uh, really a balance between the two sides of this figure, uh, between vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Um, because what we learned from the original um, SARS epidemic back in 2003 is that what happens upon infection with SARS-CoV-2, there is this immediate down regulation of ACE2 um, uh, in the body and that tips the balance towards vasoconstriction, inflammation, and pro-fibrotic forces. You know, the things that um, uh, take a patient from being on a regular hospital ward to the intensive care unit. And so animal models shown um, using the original uh, SARS epidemic in 2003, ACE2 was actually protective against further lung damage. Um, so, so therefore, the, the role of ACE2 in COVID is a bit of a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it might actually increase susceptibility of an airway cell to um, infection by the coronavirus, but on the other hand, it might be protective against some of the inflammatory fibrotic uh, effects of the virus post-infection. Um, so with this in mind, uh, we've set out to understand the relationship between ACE2 and smoking and how it might play into either susceptibility or protection from COVID-19 infection. Um, so when the uh, pandemic first hit, uh, we reached into a biobank of bronchoscopic samples that we have here at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. Um, we've profiled about 300 patients um, with airway epithelial cells, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage, and blood samples. Nor normally, I, I use these samples in my pre-pandemic life to, to study HIV in the airway, but we had a subset of HIV negative patients um, with available RNA-seq um, transcriptome data uh, that we were ready to reanalyze uh, within the context of ACE2 uh, fairly quickly um, early on in the uh, epidemic. So in our cohort, um, we noted an increase in ACE2 gene expression in current smokers compared to never smokers, with an intermediate level found in uh, former smokers. And we were able to replicate these data um, in publicly, uh, two publicly available gene expression cohorts. Uh, these are shown here on the right-hand side, um, showing a similar relationship between uh, current, uh, former, and never smokers with a higher expression of ACE2 in the airway epithelium in those who were current smokers. And um, since that time, other groups have replicated these findings and um, whether it's airway epithelial cells or lung tissue, gene expression or protein, there has been consistency that smoking increases expression of ACE2 in the lung. And what's more, um, in both mouse models and human uh, work as well, there's been this nice dose response relationship between ACE2 and uh, the amount of smoke exposure. So you can see uh, here, higher smoke exposure in the mouse lung, higher levels of ACE2 expression. And here in the human um, data, uh, the higher uh, amount of pack year smoke, uh, the higher uh, ACE2 expression in the lung. So the underlying mechanism for this has yet to be worked out, but there have been um, several additional studies now to shed light uh, on the relationship. Um, so if you look at um, some data, some single cell sequencing data now and overlay that with um, ACE2 expression, uh, there is a signal for ACE2 coming specifically from goblet and mucus producing cells. And so these secretory cells 
um, may be playing a role in the upregulation of ACE2. And so in smokers, um, these cells had, uh, you had a greater percentage of cells that were dual positive for MUC, FAB-AC, and ACE2 as well, compared to non-smokers here in blue. So smoking might increase um, the number of mucus producing smell cells as uh, one might uh, expect and these may uh, be exhibiting um, and expressing the ACE2 um, uh, receptor. Um, the other thing we have to consider is the role of um, nicotine here. So nicotine is an important modulator of the renin-angiotensin system, although it's uh, been rather conflicting in the literature whether it increases or decreases ACE2 expression. Uh, nicotine may also have um, a dual role in susceptibility versus protection to viral infections. So on the one hand, it can um, downregulate um, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, like IL-6, TNF, uh, IL-1, but on the other hand, it's also been associated with increased viral infection, for example, um, as with influenza. Um, so Russo's group very nicely showed in uh, in vitro airway epithelial cells uh, that um, if you expose these cells to higher and higher levels of nicotine here in green, you get this nice dose response uh, relationship with ACE2 expression. And moreover, what they showed was that this was specifically mediated by um, the alpha-7 uh, nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptor because when they silenced this gene using siRNA, they were able to uh, somewhat mitigate ACE2 expression. And sure enough, when we went back to uh, look at our own gene expression data, we did find a uh, significant, if um, uh, modest, correlation between ACE2 expression and um, uh, TRNA7, which is the gene that encodes uh, for the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Um, so in summary, I think there's been a fairly consistent uh, evidence now that there is upregulation of ACE2 in the airways and lungs of smokers. Um, and uh, so far, uh, groups have shown that this might uh, potentially be mediated by nicotinic receptors and the expansion of secretory cells in the airway. Um, but again, we, we don't quite know the clinical implications of these findings, whether or not they're protective or harmful as they relate to SARS-CoV-2 infections. So a lot more work has to be done um, uh, to, to really um, establish what the relationship um, is uh, between ACE2 smoking and SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I just want to thank um, uh, the investigators at our center here at UBC and uh, to uh, um, the organizers again and, and Luke for having me today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, I think that's remarkable. It's so difficult for those of us outside this to get a, a full grasp. And we probably haven't. Um, but like the literature that Silvano reviewed, we have on the one hand and on the other hand, and we do need these sorting. I, I suspect that they're not sortable in that way because it probably depends on context and timing, etc. But for now, thank you so much for that. And again, we look forward to coming back probably during the questions to, to tease it out a little bit. Thank you, Janice. Next up will be on uh, tobacco control, threats and opportunities during COVID-19. And to do that for us, we have uh, Dr. Catherine Nagby, who's in Pretoria and is a research psychologist with research interest in tobacco control, epidemiology of tobacco use and exposure to secondhand smoke, tobacco industry documents and industry monitoring smoking cessation and risk influences for youth smoking. In other words, quite a wide portfolio. She's an alumna of the Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education in the University of California, San Francisco, and is a member of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, SRNT, uh, where she won the SRNT Global Network Spotlight Award in 2016. She's also served as Section Head Tobacco Background Curriculum for the Smoking Cessation Research Certificate Program Package of SRT. She currently works as a specialist scientist in the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Research Unit in South African Medical Research Council and leads the Tobacco Control Research Agenda for her unit. 
and therefore it's a great pleasure to welcome her here to remind us that tobacco control goes on and that the threats and opportunities also go on and that we probably should be mindful of this and hopefully can take advantage of some of them. So Catherine, we we wait to thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Luke. Um, I'm just trying to confirm if you can see my slides. Can you? Uh, not yet. We can see you, which is fine. Uh, <laughs> okay. There we go. We can just make it full screen now. Mm -hmm. That's okay. great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks very much for inviting me, and um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to present um, this um, section of the webinar. So I'll just jump right into it because Luke has already introduced me. Um, I will be talking about the opportunities, briefly about the background, not much because my the other panelists have done justice to that. Um, I will talk about the opportunities and then the threats and conclude with the lessons for stakeholders. We already know that um, tobacco smoking is a known risk factor for many respiratory diseases and um, smoking compromises the lungs. And we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus affects um, the respiratory system predominantly. And early studies from China showed that uh, smokers were disproportionately affected by the, the, the virus. And this has shed more light on the importance of um, tobacco control and the harms of tobacco use, leading some governments to take very stringent steps to curb the spread of the virus, as well as protect their health system from collapse. Um, I'll talk about the opportunities now, and uh, some of them we are aware about, uh, aware of them, because uh, these are things that have, uh, you know, generated a lot of conversation and uh, discussion around uh, tobacco and tobacco control in the in the population. We know that uh, based on this link that was found between uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, infection and uh, tobacco use, uh, there's been an increased awareness of the arms, the, the harms caused by tobacco at the population level. There's an increased discussion about this um, um, effect. And this has led to people being more aware of cessation, the benefits of quitting, and the different options they have to aid their uh, quit journey. Um, in South Africa, we have experienced a high volume of calls to the national quit line, um, unprecedented, and there's been that motivation, extra motivation, as uh, uh, Silvano said, um, for people who want to quit during this period. The WHO also um, launched Meet Florence, the first digital health worker, uh, to help people quit, and that was uh, very, very good. And um, generally, we also found that um, more smokers are decreasing their number of cigarettes smoked per day, for example. Um, so those who haven't been able to quit, some of them have um, ended up reducing their tobacco use, which is good. Um, concerning the quit rates, and that has not been affected by the uh, whether the country instituted a ban or not, really, because we know that in the UK there was no ban, but studies conducted by um, um, ASH found that um, about a million people in the UK had quit smoking. That is an extrapolation from the study because they only had um, um, well over 1,000 participants in the study. So we found that, that uh, based on the fact that people, the discussion has been ongoing and the links um, described, more people are, are quitting, more young people are quitting in different countries. And this has been unprecedented um, when you look at quit uh, rates and quit attempts in the past. Now we go on to talk about the, the, the big issue that, was, that really raised a lot of controversy during this period, and that is the um, COVID-19 lockdown tobacco ban. Uh, we, ex we saw two different types of bans. The first one was the total ban on sales of tobacco products. I must add tobacco and nicotine products because electronic cigarettes were not also allowed to be sold. And this happened in South Africa, in India, and in Botswana. Um, I, I know that currently these uh, bans have been lifted, uh, as far as I know, and um, we currently have uh, the partial ban in Spain, 
which started in two regions at first and was later extended um, and nationwide. Now the brand had its upsides and its um, and its downsides. I categorized the upsides as uh, the opportunities afforded to tobacco control, which mirrors um, what uh, the general uh, um, opportunities were actually. So there's because of the ban, there's been that increased discussion about the harms of tobacco use um, in the population. The more people are aware about the harms caused by tobacco use. There's an increased intention to quit. There's an increased uh, quit attempts, and of course, um, increased quit rates. In South Africa, one study conducted by the University of Cape Town found that about 16% of um, smokers in South Africa uh, um, reported having quit during the ban. Um, but about 12% of that 16% reported that they would go back to smoking when the ban is lifted. And But if you look at it, that is about um, between 800,000 to a million people um, using the current um, smoking prevalence in South Africa, which is about 22%. Um, we, I'll talk about the threats to tobacco control, uh, which are a lot, actually. Um, we know that uh, the tobacco industry interference it has always been a threat to tobacco control. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, it hasn't changed. So we experienced in South Africa, for example, the government being taken to court by um, two different tobacco companies or um, associations. We had the Free Independent Tobacco Association, which is um, the association for the small tobacco companies, while uh, BAT also instituted their um, uh, own court case against the government during the ban. And the case was to essentially um, remove tobacco as one of the non-essential items, um, which resulted in their not being sold during the ban, during the lockdown. Um, that uh, ban has been lifted, so uh, the cases have uh, not progressed uh, further. Also, the tobacco industry made efforts to establish working relationships with um, governments during this um, pandemic. We know that that is against uh, the WHO Article 5. Uh, FCTC Article 5.3. Um, they did that by joining the, the COVID-19 vaccine race and calling on governments to join them in um, uh, providing a vaccine for this um, pandemic, for the disease. We also know that they donated uh, to governments COVID-19 solidarity funds, and they donated PPEs and hospital equipment, um, mechanical ventilators in some countries, um, in a bid to create um, that impression that they are um, helping in the in the in the in the countries, so um, based on on the fact that they've been involved in um, or their products are, have been implicated in increasing the disease severity of COVID-19, it, it it sounded very um, disingenuous for them to to do that. Also, we uh, had we saw reports of the industry pushing back on some tobacco control measures, um, using the COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse. In Indonesia, they pushed back on excess tax increase, and in the EU, they pushed back on the ban on menthol. Uh, I'll talk about marketing in the next slide. So um, based on the fact that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this rush and um, scarcity of PPEs, it was quite interesting seeing some of the publications or some of the marketing strategies that were devised by the industry during this period, where they, um, they mentioned that they would be giving out freebies that were in the form of um, COVID-19 related PPEs like gloves, masks, and uh, hand sanitizers to their customers during this period. And, and that, that itself is a threat. It goes against um, some of the um, articles in the FCTC. And that was, uh, I believe, was difficult for some governments to monitor during the time that they were trying to take care of their citizens. 
Another threat was the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic created its own stress on the population in the world. All over the world, people were more stressed, people were having issues with dealing with the, the outcomes and the, and the fears of the pandemic. And so some smokers were um, also reported to have increased their use of tobacco products. The Foundation for a Smoke-Free World found in their study that nearly 40% of smokers in five countries had increased their use. And another study conducted in, in the Netherlands found that about 19% of smokers had increased their use of the product. I also want to mention um, that the, the controversy about nicotine being protective against COVID-19 um, is also a threat, in my opinion, because um, it created that noise in the, in the communication that we were trying to make about people needing to quit during this period. And I also feel, I also believe that it threatened the uh, smokers who uh, wanted to, to, to quit smoking using um, um, smoking cessation aids like uh, nicotine patches um, in France, for example, they had to ban the online sales of tobacco of nicotine products, and that created a problem, I believe, for, for smokers. So the downside of the lockdown ban is that it also created or uh, it increased or expanded the illicit tobacco market. In South Africa, there were reports of about 90% of smokers who had not quit being able to access tobacco products. Because of the ban, all products that were sold in the country during the ban were, uh, could be considered as illegal, as illicit. And so uh, for 90% of the population to access tobacco products, it means that they were patronizing the illicit market. That was a bit, um, that was, um, um, a bit uh, regulated uh, to some extent because the products were not cheap as they used to be. So there were, there, there were reports, um, anecdotal reports that people stopped smoking because the price was too high for them to, to, to afford. There was also the public outcry and loss of some goodwill um, by the tobacco control community. I remember when I was trying to um, sign the affidavit in support of the government's case, um, um, the, the, the official who was signing it was questioning me and asking, are you one of those who is preventing us from smoking our tobacco products? And so that kind of created um, some um, loss of goodwill, I believe. And of course, the tobacco industry exploited that and tried to gain public sympathy by um, organizing, um, you know, hashtags and protests to get the government to lift the ban. Another interesting thing I saw about the downside of the ban was that in India, um, tobacco products were, uh, the sales of tobacco products were, were banned. But then in Bhutan, which is the only country in the world that has banned tobacco uh, use, uh, they had to lift their ban in order to prevent people from India coming to patronize their illicit market as a way to prevent uh, COVID-19 from spreading to their country. So I, I, I believe that is also um, uh, something that was uh, not nice for tobacco control. I'll just talk uh, briefly about the lessons for stakeholders in my last two slides. Um, for the government, I believe that this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the role of tobacco in the burden of non-communicable diseases and some infectious diseases. It also highlights the importance of Article 5.3 and the need for countries to implement measures to curb uh, or to regulate industry interaction with government. Um, I believe that it's important for, um, for, the, for countries to become party to the protocol to eliminate illicit tobacco trade, because one of the problems with the ban was the expansion of the illicit um, um, tobacco market. Um, concerning smoking cessation, I, I, I believe that the government, especially in low and middle income countries, they need to do more in terms of their approach to smoking cessation. There's need for uh, programs to be put in place because at some point it, it became the smokers versus non-smokers fight during the ban because the smokers felt they were not being cared for. Those who were addicted to nicotine needed help and these products that they needed to use to help them quit were not cheap. And, and there was no measure put in place to help them to purchase that at uh, these products at lower prices and to help them quit. 
for tobacco control advocates and researchers, um, the, the importance of education and awareness at the population level was, you know, very prominent during this period. Um, it, it became very, very glaring that if you do not um, give the right information out there, the industry was going to fill the void with lies and um, they will buy the people's sympathy. And um, there's also the need for the availability of local data because um, I, I do not believe that um, um, tobacco should be banned for banning sake. There should be information guiding the um, legislation that are put in place during the, pan the, the pandemic to help people quit. Um, the, the need for using precautionary approach to guide policy implementation is important, but at some point there's need for clear communication about the reasons for any action, and there's need for cessation support for smokers so that we can get um, the public buy-in. And then the big issue of jobs, um, was very prominent during this period because we know that one of the fallouts of the pandemic is the loss of jobs. Uh, today, it was reported in South Africa that during the second quarter of this year, 2.2 million jobs were lost. And so you can imagine in a country where we have this problem with um, um, unemployment, the industry coming out to say they are providing jobs will definitely buy public sympathy. So I believe that um, tobacco control advocates and researchers need to do more in uh, providing alternative sources of life, livelihood uh, and, and, and having this discussion with policymakers in order to find a solution to um, their, their sources of income, especially during this time uh, of, um, the global, um, of the global economic um, problems posed by COVID-19. And there's also need for more accurate documentation of smoking uh, status data because um, we found that when we're doing the expert affidavit for the, to, to back the case for the South African government, there was this confusion about whether it was it was um, important for people to quit now as against later. Um, so the industry was making the, the the point or the argument that if you quit now, it doesn't have any positive impact on your health because former smokers are not necessarily disproportionately affected compared to never smokers. So I think that uh, because of the poor quality of data, as uh, mentioned by the last two speakers, it was quite um, a challenge to make that point very clear. And the role of the media in tobacco control is very critical and, and there's need to recognize and use that to help drive the discussion um, to help uh, uh, push tobacco control um, forward. Um, and I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, I think we need to be aware of all that, and it, certainly you've raised very important issues for us. And I think each of us in our own places have, have these things to contend with. Well, I thank all three speakers for keeping us roughly to time. We do now have uh, uh, some opportunity to um, get some more information and uh, get some questions perhaps answered. Um, while we're getting those together, uh, I think if I would stay with you, um, Catherine, as, as you're, you're on, uh, I would wonder about this illicit trade. You know, it's a big part of the industry to tell us anything we do increases illicit trade. Have you actually measured it, or are we depending? Where are we getting our information on this? Um, thanks, Luke. I think that uh, for South Africa during the lockdown ban, there, there's really no um, controversy in terms of the expansion of the illicit tobacco market because, like I mentioned, every cigarette that was sold during that period can be considered illicit because they were not supposed to be sold. You could smoke if you if you were able to stock up but you couldn't buy um, officially. So um, during the lockdown, uh, it, was, it was a given that any cigarette you could buy would have been purchased from the illicit market. But I must say that um, immediately the ban was lifted. It was as if there was a, the, the closing of the tap <laughs> because the discussion around illicit died down and things 
kind of changed. There's no study that has been conducted currently to find out if there's still that um, uh, um, patron uh, uh, people patronizing the illicit market, but at least we're not hearing so much about the illicit market as we were hearing at that uh, period. And I agree with you that the industry always, you know, um, tries to um, make bogus claims about the illicit market. Yeah. Absolutely, and especially. Uh, as we know that illicit trade depends on having established networks and I'd be surprised if they all of a sudden came in because of, of COVID. So I would think uh, within your researches that um, keeping a tab on that. I, also, of course, if there's a ban, all trade is illicit, but uh, that supposes that there's 100% compliance, which would be unusual in, in any so I think we yeah. need to keep a close eye on that. And I agree as well, yeah. the, the obvious problem about 5.3, obviously social distancing doesn't have much effect on the industry. And they have, and we've heard and some of the people who have dialed in from questions have, have raised this issue that they're doing these uh, corporate responsibility, social responsibility sort of activities with PP and so on that you've said. And this is dry from an industry that's killing people. But uh, how did you respond to that? I think you may have said a little bit about it. How do you think that a country should respond? It's very hard to turn down items that you need. I, I um, Thanks, Luke. I think that um, the big problem with uh, that uh, issue is that we are in a pandemic and everybody is trying to help and uh, governments are looking for money. Um, the South African government had to get a loan from the IMF. So it's quite difficult for <laughs> tobacco control um, advocates to say, or researchers to say, don't collect that money, you know, at this point. That, that, that was why I mentioned that it's very important that countries put in place measures to implement Article 5.3 at country level. Hopefully, if that is in place, that would have guided the interaction with government at this time. Um, I think that another way that um, some people, um, I would say the global tobacco control community responded to that was to call out the industry. So the, uh, I know that the, the University of Bath and um, some other um, um, advocacy organizations, um, they, they made um, sure to call out the industry and to expose their hypocrisy, um, you know, trying to solve a problem that they are contributing to. So I, I believe that, um, that that is that was the best they could do at this time, given the the, the situation that we were in, I say, in the world. Yeah. Is is there any evidence that the industry have changed their attitude to the imposition of taxation? We know that all countries need extra money now, and the best way and the only way to get that, perhaps internally, is through taxation. Have they changed their attitude to that? Not at all, <laughs> not at all. I, and they are actually, uh, based on uh, you know what we've seen happening in other places, um, we, we, they're actually using the COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse not to be taxed. <laughs> you know, so they they, they 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 are trying to make sure that they get the best out of the pandemic as well. So of course, they're yeah. not they're not changing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine. I Thank hope you're still with us, Janice. Uh, when we were looking at yours, obviously we had the reality of what you found and the difficulty of knowing what it really means. But what people are interested in, I think, as well as the reality of what exists is whether this there are any therapeutic implications. Right. Yeah. So, we yeah, we're actually working on that in the lab right now. Uh, we've been testing. Uh, different uh, steroid compounds uh, and um, different uh, antibiotics on our uh, epithelial cells to see if there has been a modulation of ACE2. Now, if you look at the data, looking kind of retrospectively at, say, cohorts of asthma patients, and some of those were on um, inhaled corticosteroids that might downregulate ACE2. Um, but we're testing it currently in our uh, uh, in vitro work right now. 
Hopefully we'll get that out soon. Thank you. Um, and you're with us, uh, Silvano, as well, I imagine. Now, you, um, when you were speaking to us, you told us the importance of the slide that you didn't uh, expound on. If you would like to perhaps go back to that and explain to us how the biases are active in the literature at present. Yes, uh, if I uh, treat that slide so easily. This yes. is the one which showed the overrepresentation, um, perhaps of. Yes. Uh, can I share my screen? Okay, perfect. So, uh, do you yes, see my fine. screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, uh, the, the point is that uh, we uh, noticed that uh, the, most uh, longitudinal studies uh, uh, had this uh, uh, this. Uh, um, selection bias. Uh, the main point is that uh, uh, current smokers are uh, more frequently tested than never smokers. If uh, I assume that there is no association, let's imagine, let's assume that there is no association between uh, smoking and uh, uh, the risk of COVID-19 infection, as uh, we can see from this uh, from this infograph. In here, we have 100 white men that are non smokers and 100 uh, red men who are current smokers. And there are three uh, COVID 19 uh, persons in both groups. And therefore, the real odds ratio is uh, one. But uh, given that, uh, given that uh, smokers, uh, uh, have uh, a higher risk to be tested among the suspected population and therefore among people with symptoms of COVID-19 with influenza-like symptoms, there will be an overrepresentation of smokers. And that's why if we, I consider only suspected population, I could uh, obtain an apparent odds ratio of 0 0.58 because in, in this population um, SARS-CoV-2 positive subjects are 30 percent among uh, non-smokers and only 20 percent among current smokers. That's why it is possible uh, that these studies suffer from um, from an important selection bias, from an important selection bias. I hope this is helpful, but it is something new because it is not uh, yet discussed too much, but I believe it is extremely important. And if we consider findings only on uh, studies that are generalizable to the general population, the uh, risk, the relative risks are different. This is something we have found. Thank you very much. I think that is very important, perhaps not very easy, but uh, it will get clearer to us when we think about it. And I, I agree that it is important. So I think we really are running out of time and really it just behoves me to, to thank the speakers uh, very much each one and specially selected and I think did a great job and I'm very grateful to Silvane and Janice, Janice and Catherine and thank you very much. As we know, speakers and other presenters, that this would not have happened without uh, Joanna who is uh, driving us and personally he Gaudi, Dr. Gaudi who is uh, helping with me we're working together to bring you this webinar and without her, it would not have been anything like it is. So if it was any good, I thank Hebe for it. Uh, obviously, I thank the audience. It's a very unreal situation, but I suppose we're getting used to it. And we're very grateful for those of you who did look in. And as uh, Joanna has said, this will be available um, as a download afterwards in a, in a few days time. So I think uh, 
with that, I'll, I'll close this seminar and just hand back to Joanne to officially close since she controls the buttons. Joanna. Thank you very much, Professor Luke. Thank you all for attending today's webinar organized by the Union and the 18th World Conference on Tobacco or Health Scientific and Track Committees. At the end of the session, you will receive a survey. Please don't hesitate to complete it because your feedback is important to us. The recording of this webinar will be available in a few days. You can find it on the WCTOH YouTube channel. Don't forget to visit our website, www.wctoh.org, and register to our newsletter to stay updated on our various activities. Finally, I take the opportunity to remind you that this year's Union World Conference on Lung Health will be held virtually from the 20th till the 24th of October. For more information, please visit worldlunghealth.org. Thank you all. <laughs>